Okay, so this is episode three of um, African Safari Mag, and today I've got the pleasure of bringing you Rachel Rubibo from all the way from Zambia. She is a wildlife photographer and wildlife or wild lodge marketing specialist. And um, yeah, very excited to have you on the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. So you are not at camp at the moment, hey? No, no. Um, the camp that I work at the most is closed for rainy season. It's in Lower Zambezi National Park. And once the rains hit mid-November, everybody closes until about April. Some people open in May, but it's black cotton soil, so not, not drivable. So if anyone that doesn't know, what I mean, what, what does black cotton soil refer to? Um, it's like a dense clay soil that when wet becomes a very thick mud that sort of just eats the tires of the vehicle and it's very easy to get stuck and it creates driving conditions that are pretty much impossible even tractors can get stuck in black cotton soil so so tell me does that does that soil then also give you a, a unique sort of environmental landscape when it's when it's not raining uh can't say I'm an expert on soil, so I don't want to. <laughs> I was just wondering, maybe, maybe, it, <laughs> like maybe it, like um, it had a certain like cupid or any certain vegetation or trees possibly grow on it. I mean, Lower Zambezi has a very unique landscape, but as far as I know, black cotton soil is is present in other areas than the Zambezi Valley, whereas there are other elements of the ecosystem that are not present elsewhere. So, I I wouldn't want to surmise on something that i'm not an expert on i'll get a soil experts on one of these days yeah you should that would be a really interesting topic of like kalahari sand and black cotton soil and you know it's amazing actually... I mean, yeah as you go to different like countries and even lodges i'm not even lodges even reserves within a country it's amazing the the different the different soils and vegetation that goes on safari i think like a lot of people expect safari to be safari if they haven't been on one it all kind of looks the same but it's so unique yeah from, i mean from even from one reserve to the next i think most people when they think of safari have a very east africa landscape that pops into their mind so like savannas and open plains with umbrella thorns and sort of great wide expanse when uh, southern africa there are areas that are like that, that but the majority of it is not necessarily like that yeah it kind of, it kind of feels like um, people have been watching a lot of lion king definitely yeah definitely we can talk about all of the inaccuracies of the lion king if you want <laughs> well, that might be a while i mean i've been on a safari and so <laughs> literally ask them if, if there's a place called Pride Rock somewhere. It's quite funny. I believe there is. I think it is a real place. That's what I have heard is Pride Rock is actually named after a real place in, in East Africa. Yeah. But there are no meerkats there that I can say with confidence. Really? I actually never knew that. No, there's no meerkats outside of the Kalahari. Wow, I actually never knew that. That's that is very nice. Yeah. Besides the fact you got a talk, talking warthog. <laughs> no, Timon and Timon and Pumbaa would never would never be friends. They would have never known each other. There yeah. are definitely no meerkats in Kenya. Yeah. So so tell me something. <laughs> um, let's before we get into all the conspiracy theories around safaris. Tell me about um your journey. Um, yeah. How how did you end up being a wildlife photographer, and um, how did you end up? Because you obviously got an accent. So where are you from, and how did you end up doing what you're doing? Um. Oof, that's a long. That's a long one. Um. I grew up in the states. I grew up outside of Washington D.C. And I started photographing when I was ten. Um. Yeah. And I I went to sort of a liberal arts high school in in the city in DC where we had a lot of room to explore creativity and do independent studies. I did a lot of photography work there. I did a lot of darkroom work there. I'm dating myself and revealing my age by saying that. <laughs> but when I started, everything was on film. And then I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York and I majored in photography there. It was also still film at that point. I think around the time I grad I graduated, things were transitioning to digital. Then I went to Paris for a three month 
photo workshop and I ended up staying there for 20 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I've had like several different iterations of photographer. I was a I was a fine art photographer for a hot minute, a couple of years, and I worked with a gallery in Paris and then I became a fashion photographer. I did fashion and advertising in Paris and New York and I did that for about 12 years. And while I was doing that professionally, I started dabbling in wildlife photography as sort of my personal passion work. And I loved it so much. And I just kept coming back to it. And it kind of intermixes with a, a personal path where um, I became vegan. And I, I hate saying that because everyone's always like, how do you know a vegan? They'll tell you, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> I mean, we're about five minutes into the interview. <laughs> but, um... but it does actually relate to, to, to my transition because I just got so in touch with sort of my love for animals and my love for nature. And I think working in fashion anymore didn't align with my values and didn't really represent a world that spoke to me anymore. And so, yeah, I made the transition full time to wildlife photography, although I would say it's more safari photography than wildlife photography because I do a lot of lifestyle around the camp and I also do interiors and photos of staff and, and that kind of thing. So it's not just exclusively animals, although that's, my, of course, my favorite part. But, yeah, it's, it's a bit more broad. That's quite interesting. I mean, because I've noticed, I mean, I knew you were a photographer. I didn't realize you had such a, like a pedigree of photography, like working with galleries <laughs> and is, is pretty, pretty intense. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's quite a, that's not a real typical route to being a wildlife photographer, is it? I mean, you meet a lot of wildlife photographers, I'm sure at the lodge. Um. I, I don't actually meet them that often. We try and stagger them so that I'm not in camp at the same time as like a large wildlife photographer. It makes life easier for everyone if we're not shooting the same same content. Um, but I, I don't actually know what the typical path is of a wildlife photographer. I don't know if there's a typical path for any photographer. I think people sort of find their way into it. And I don't think there's one right way to become a professional photographer. I think everyone is kind of just figuring it out. And for some people, it's right place, right time. For some people, it's, you know, years and years and years of, of hard work. I mean, for everyone, it's years of hard work. But some people, you know, yeah, you meet the right person, right opportunity presents itself. And there you find yourself. And for other people, it's not bad. And I don't really think that there's a one direct line to professional photographer. So that's a, that's a question people ask me a lot is how did you become a professional safari photographer? And it's, you know, it's a long, it's a long story. You know, I mean, what you've said is actually correct. And like, I've met so many different wildlife photographers and wildlife photographers are or safari photographers are all, they're quite unique. I think like in other, in other forms of it, because you can't, I mean, like, as far as I know, I don't know if you can study wildlife photography. You could probably do a course on it, but it's not the classic thing you go to university for. Yeah, I don't know. And I'm sure it's changed so much from when I went to school for photography, but it was very, it was very holistic. So a lot, I mean, at that time, having a certain amount of technical knowledge and technical skill was essential to create a photograph like you could not look at the screen to see if you got the exposure correct so it was very important to understand the exposure triangle to understand optics and the way your lenses work to understand how to set up studio lights and back then we had to take polaroids for a light check to make sure everything was you know because otherwise you would waste film and you would waste a, a potential client's time you you know if your film is overexposed or underexposed so there's a lot of there's history of photography there was um, a fair amount of math I would say probably more math than I wanted there to be in a photography program uh, definitely a lot of life study like we we did a lot of 
nudes of people in, in different ages, like similar to when you do, you know, fine art drawing and you have to do life drawing of different body figures, that kind of thing. So it was, it was very, it was very holistic approach. Um, there wasn't a advertising photographer or fine out fine art photographer like it was kind of just a global photography major and then you kind of refined it after that i heard a story the other day um it was a, a writer and a photographer that well, he's like he's fairly old i mean he must be he must be in like um 50 um yeah but is that fairly old oh, well i don't know like i'm, the, I'm trying to i'm trying to like, I, I don't know how old i mean i don't know how old <laughs> I, I don't want to like. I don't want to get this out the right decade. But anyway, the point being is, um, he used to go on. Um, he used to go on. Um, he used to go on trips, and he's a writer and a photographer. And literally, he would go on a trip with say, twenty rolls of film, and he would leave the country after his film was finished. Like imagine that, like back in the day with film, where you just go somewhere and you literally shoot until your film's done, and then you come back home. Yeah, I mean, twenty rolls of film does not sound like a lot to me, but that. That sounds in, like I may, have, I may have I may have misquoted the amount of film, <laughs> but, but the, the point was he went on with a certain amount of film. Yeah, and... there you know there are some who still do it. There's uh, Richard Moss is a fantastic photographer. I don't know if you've heard of him. He did um, a lot of images in West Africa with Kodak infrared film, which turns like the greens very pink, and they have these very surreal colors. Uh, he he does some amazing work, and I know he still frequently works in film. And I actually interviewed him like a decade ago for a website I used to do on film photography. And he said that essentially he had a, a cooler box with him at all times with his infrared film inside because it was very temperature sensitive. And everywhere he went, the struggle was like procuring ice and like freezing ice packs to keep his film cold and that, that was like one of his biggest biggest struggles working that way but the images are very beautiful yeah that is um it is cool i mean like there's a certain art to that um yeah i think that's quite um you got to be quite on the high end of the photographer and yeah, i'm sure you know like when you're shooting content for for lodges and people like you can't afford you need to give them so many different options but it's always nice to have a film camera with you I mean, I think I might get a lot of hate for this, especially because I used to be a big person in the film photography community. But I think today, unless you're shooting eight by 10 landscape photography, which is where the film is like a sheet of paper and like a large field camera with fellows, I, I think the quality of digital at this point far surpasses film. So it's really just sort of a nostalgic, like a nostalgic feel to it. What are you shooting on at the moment? on a sony alpha one. Oh, those are beautiful eh? yeah it's a great camera i love it it's fantastic yeah I, mirrorless I is such a game changer yeah i'm on the r series and the s series um yeah i prefer to have i prefer like because i do a lot of pictures and videos so i prefer having like two cameras with me but I, in ideal world i'd have two a1s yeah i mean um, me too yeah <laughs> I mean, that's a bit of an arm and a leg. Did you see the, the the new A9 that came out? It shoots 120 frames per second. Oh, no, I did not. Yeah, it's an incredible wildlife camera. Like, it's insane. I did a, I went on a Sony wildlife thing a while back. I just couldn't believe the autofocus and how it locks onto subjects. It's... The eye tracking is particularly amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Where it'll, like, track the eye of a leopard walking. That's. It's incredible how it holds the focus and stuff because, like, normally to yeah. focus on, like, especially if it's a walking towards you, it's really, really tough. It is. Even with it, it's still tough because, especially if you're shooting with, you know, a very long zoom lens, which most of us are, I think I'm frequently shooting at like 600, the depth of field becomes so shallow at that focal length that, you know, as soon as they move a little bit, they're like out of the range of focus and you have to readjust. So it's, I think, I think sharpness and getting everything in focus is kind of a constant, constant battle for wildlife photographers. It's nothing worse when you've got that like perfect shot and then the face isn't in focus or it's yeah, brutal. Uh, it is quite brutal because they are. Yeah. yeah. And also, I mean, like, um, it's obviously shooting normally in quite low light. It's the end of the day, like it's hard. And there's a bit of like with the long lens, you obviously, there's a lot of movement. Yeah. It's got to be up. 
I think that's something that it's, you know, people try and fight, but if you don't have enough light, you don't have enough light. There's just nothing you can do. There's nothing, there's nothing you can do to fix it when you don't have enough light. I agree. I feel like, I must say, I have got one or two beautiful pictures. I mean, like, I, like I literally just like sprayed. I mean, I think I, it was, it was after dark and there's a spotlight on and like, there was about, I probably took about a hundred pictures and between, I think there's one or two that came out really nicely. The rest were like, yeah. but you never know. Like sometimes you get nothing, but I have got one or two where just like the spotlight's just there enough and lights up the animal's eyes. And like, it's just that split second. Cause you're like, you can't really, you can't shine on the animals obviously because of the animals, but also if, even if you did, that they would be blown out. So it's like that, that perfect split second where like it just lights yeah. up enough. Yeah, definitely. So tell me, so what, what lens do you shoot with then? Um, most often I shoot with a 200 to 600. And f-stop? Uh, f uh, 4.5. 4.5. Is it, um, so you shoot mainly in obviously low Zambezi. I am in Lower Zambezi a lot. Yeah, definitely a lot. And um, I also shoot a fair amount in, in Wangi in Zimbabwe and also in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. So what is, um, so which is your favorite area to shoot? I mean, like, I mean, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to go, to but like, which is your, which are your favorite areas or what makes them unique? I would have to say Lower Zambezi is definitely my favorite location to shoot. The Okavango Delta is a, cl a very close second. They're like, you know, kind of right here, but there's something about Lower Zambezi. It's such a unique landscape with the forest and the river and the plains. And when the light comes in the forest and it just lights everything up. And um, one of the things that I love the most is a very glowy yellow soft light that's definitely a signature of mine and it happens a lot in lower zambezi you've got the the light shafts coming through the trees and the forest the animals walk through it and it's just it's just very magical it's a very magical place yeah i've seen some of the the, the pictures you've taken there that's absolutely incredible and that, there's that sort of that blue that sort of blue haze that's in the background through the forest which is also so beautiful yeah so it's Monopoles and Lower Zambezi have the same ecosystem, and in Monopoles, they actually call it the Blue Forest because of that blue haze you get in the distance. And we call it the the Winter Thorn Winter Thorn Forest on the Zambia side. But yeah, it's that it's like when you look deep into the distance into the the forest, you see this sort of blue purple haze among the trees. It's it's really really beautiful. And then at certain times of day, it'll kind of change more. But yeah, it creates for just beautiful photographic opportunities. Are you allowed to go off road in in Low Zambezi? No. No, <laughs> that's a short answer. <laughs> I, know, I know some parks. I know some parks are allowed to go off um, if it's a private concession or if it's like a cat or wild dogs or something like that. Um, yeah, where... like we don't do private concessions in Zambia. That's that's definitely not a thing. But I. I would say it's like a little bit more lenient with dogs, but it's technically not allowed. And yeah, I mean, how many other, are there quite a lot of lodges? What is the, like the density of lodges in the area do? So does everyone share the same space? Uh, the park is, is quite long. So you have sort of different sections of the park. You have the area by the, the main gate, which is Chongwe, and there's quite a few camps there. There's a significant amount of camps in the GMA, the game management area, which is like the buffer zone right outside the park. Yeah. Then you have sort of a middle section, um, and there's, I think, three or four camps there in the middle. And then... Anabezi, where I work, is on the far eastern end of the park, and we are four camps over there. So it's not not super high density. Probably the highest density is closest to the gate, but it's rather remote, wild. There's no signs. There's no human structures. There's even the roads. Like if you don't know them, you might not be able to see them. There's no camping in the park very rarely do you see self drivers it's extremely rare and it's not recommended it's very easy to get lost oh okay that makes sense yeah and it so definitely makes for like a more exclusive private feeling 
safari experience because you won't find yourself with like 20 vehicles out of sighting ever. Yeah, that does make a huge difference. I mean, like the parks in South Africa can get, if you're not on the private concession, um, you can get quite a lot of traffic. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've seen videos from Tanzania that give me anxiety. Yeah, it's um. There's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of cars. Yeah, there's a lot <laughs> like of... fifty vehicles encircling a cheetah. You know, it's it, it kind of stresses me out to see it. So, um, I did. I mean, I think it's better for the animals and better for the environment when you have you know a limit. The limit in Lower Zambezi is four, and everybody tries to respect that as much as possible. So if there's um so for anyone that you you're referring to if there's like a sighting if there's a lion yeah it's allowed and if there's and they have to wait for someone to move off for the next one to move in yeah you would wait and you know in theory somebody pulls out when their guests are done and then you pull in and everybody kind of does their best to share so you've got some very interesting animal dynamics on and lows and easy and you we've spoken a little bit before about the leopard family which is quite unique i mean i'd love to hear a bit more about them yeah we do they um so we we have a family of leopards that stays together it's called a leap of leopards i found that out recently because you don't often see them in a group um in june there were about five that we were seeing together almost all the time so the mother, and she has two sub-adult cubs. They are almost three. Then the male that she mates with regularly. And then she had a five-month-old cub. And okay. so we would see them all together frequently, like feeding and interacting and spending time together. It was really, really special. And even her, one of the daughters was babysitting the newest cub, which is very unusual. Um, I think it just highlights how much we don't really know about animal behavior because there's a lot we don't see. Because we have everyone has a tendency to say leopards are very solitary animals because traditionally that's what we see. But for example, the cub unfortunately didn't make it. She was killed by a rival male. But the mother and the two sisters, we still see them together all the time and they they'll occasionally have little spats, but more often than not, they're quite affectionate and playful with each other. Yeah, it's so nice when you see, well, a leap of leopards. I mean, I've never, I think yeah. I've seen two at most, but yeah, seeing five of them must have been quite special. It was, yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. And I think everyone was very pumped about it because you would go out and almost every day you would see this family of five leopards. It was really, really exceptional. And when the cub was killed by a rival male, I mean, everybody took it pretty hard. Oh, I can imagine. Does the, yeah. the does the the father or the 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 male that's does he hang around quite a lot? I mean, because it's not normal that that's also that would normally also move off, wouldn't they? Yeah. So he kind of he kind of comes in and out. I have not seen him since I think July was the last time I saw him. He kind of comes in and out, and he had left the area when a younger male came in and found the cub, unfortunately. We were all a little bit angry with him, like, where are you? <laughs> why are you not Why are you not defending your territory? But, you know, it, it's actually very common. It happens a lot. It happens a lot with lions. It happens a lot with leopards that, you know, whether it's the same species or another predator that a lot of cubs just don't make it, unfortunately. Yeah, it is, it is quite crazy. And um, like having the family must make it even their chances even higher. But I mean, you can imagine like normal solo female leopards trying to raise cubs must be quite intense. Yeah, and it's really tough. Um, yeah, it really is. Lions, hyenas, other leopards. It's, it's not an, being a mother leopard is not an easy job. Yeah. And um, then you've also got the, is it the Jackie wild dog pack? So there's some arguments on the name. <laughs> <laughs> we technically dogs are supposed to be named by where they den. And this pack denned in Jackie for a while. And then they moved and they were denning elsewhere. 
And so we were calling them the Zambezi pack at Anabezi until we were kind of certain where they were going to settle and den for good and then go with that name. Uh, but a lot of people do call them the Jackie pack. Right now they've split. So the yeah. dynamics have changed a lot. But last year there were, I think at their biggest point, there were 46 of them wow. all together. Yeah. And they were hunting buffalo, which was incredible to see. Uh, we had BBC and National Geographic come to film them because their size is just, you know. Incredible seeing like seeing all of them hunt together must be incredible. It is. It's it was really really special. It was a very special time seeing like you know forty six dogs kind of all spread out in a line coming across the plains and they are I mean they are incredible hunters. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens with the pack this year since the split because so the alpha went off with a group and then the beta went off with a group and then it looks like the betas group has kind of split and come back together but when they were very very large both the alpha and the beta were breeding which is also quite unusual and it's part of how they got so big the are you talking about a beta female yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the alpha female and the beta female do um do, do, is there an alpha is it's a it's an alpha couple do you get an alpha couple or i don't know if it's different different dynamics with you got how, do, how does yours work there is normally an alpha couple yes um i can't say when you're looking at 46 of them that you can say that's the alpha male the, the female is a lot easier to pick out because she'll be the one who gets up and leaves the group leads the group and everybody follows yeah. and then the the alpha of this pack has a spot on her back that kind of looks like the number one yeah so that made it a little bit easier to identify her but i, I think unless you happen to come across them mating it would be rather difficult to pinpoint who the alpha male is so would only the male then mate with the alpha female in theory yes okay, okay. And then, um, so with the, 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 the beta also, did you also breed then or was it, they were both, they both had litters. Yeah. So the, they were both breeding the alpha female and the beta female were both breeding regularly, like each, each year during denning season. But again, it's hard to know if the beta female was mating with the alpha male or if it was another male. It's it's really difficult to know because they all look very similar. So it's not you can't and they're not collared. Yeah. Um, none of them are collared, so you can't say, oh, that one is the alpha male, and now he's mating with the beta female. It's hard to hard to tell. So the the beta, the, would there be other females below the beta? The beta is a step up from the rest of the females still, or would she be the equivalent to any of the other females in the pack? I honestly don't know. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to like say yes or no, if, if it's something I'm not positive on, I genuinely do not know. I would assume the beta is second to the alpha, but typically only the alpha female breeds. So yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to know. The pack had relatively unusual behavior. Normally a wild dog pack before they get to like 45, they split. And yeah. then th this pack stayed together. And I think they figured out that if they stayed together as a group, they could take down much larger game like Buffalo. Yeah. Um, and then we don't really know sort of what triggered the split this year. It happened in, I think right, right around denning season. So like June. I think what's been incredible in the last couple of years, I think with so much with the advancements technology and so many people spending time, like I think people are realizing that there's so much about animals that they didn't really realize. I mean, people yeah. have areas that like animals only did this. And I think it's coming very clear that animals don't only do what people expect them to do. And it's, so it's yeah. super interesting to see the dynamics of a pack that's so big. And I think there's still so much that we don't see you know, I think there's still so much behavior and dynamics going on that we don't see. Um, and we have, Laura Zambezi has a very strict policy of not going to the den. And yeah. at, at the same time, where both of their dens are would be very difficult to access. There's no road access there and there's a lot of thickets. So even if, even if you tried, it would be difficult to get there. But I, I know in, 
I know in monopoles there was like an issue with people going to the den too much and then I believe in Botswana they do sort of a they do sort of a check of where the puppies are at and then they'll create a barrier around the den so that you don't get too close and then you can kind of go see so different parks have sort of different um rules about it but in lower zambezi you're not allowed to go to the den under any circumstances so there's a huge amount of interaction and behavior about this particular pack that nobody sees yeah and i suppose with the wild dogs i mean where their den is like is so it's so secret because the pups are so vulnerable to such to other predators so you almost don't yeah. want the dogs don't you almost don't want the dogs to think that anyone knows where their den is because they might you don't want them to move it for on on the sake of humans yeah and they're so um i mean they're very endangered i don't actually think they're classified on the red list but they should be because there's you know i think around six thousand left in the wild and they're in my opinion a very misunderstood and unappreciated animal and i think it's vital to give them space to reproduce um without interfering or without bothering them so if you disturb them they can abandon the puppies yeah it's um yeah they're such beautiful animals they are like i love watching the dynamics i love how they play yeah. with like there's like i love how they like how they start each morning like playing with each other and sort of socializing and then how they hunt it's it's just really incredible to i mean i watched a video the other day of them of them hunting buffalo and it was filmed by a drone it was just incredible watching them how they flank and it's a hard like it's it's such like it's such complex like strategies that they that they and it's all led yeah. by alpha i mean it's unreal how they communicate with each other it's it's really crazy yeah and really amazing teamwork like working together as a as a unit um and i i think one of the things i like the most about dogs is the sort of the contrast because with each other they're incredibly social and loving and like very family and community oriented you know like dogs won't abandon an injured pack member or they don't abandon old pack members like they really take care of each other and then they turn around and they're just these absolutely vicious hunters. Like, if you, I mean, I'm sure you've seen a dog kill. They tear an impala to shreds in 30 seconds. It's just yeah. gone. Yeah. Um, which I personally think that that's more humane than watching an animal be suffocated by a lion for like 20 minutes. Um, because at least it's over quickly. But I do know a lot of people find it really brutal and don't want to see it. Yeah, I know it is. It is very brutal. Um, mm. Sure, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'd want to choose one if it was me. <laughs> um, but um, as long as it's not a crocodile. But um, no, they are. Yeah, croc uh, would be bad. That would be very bad. Yeah, I don't think I'd yeah. enjoy this. But um, no, wild dogs. Are pretty, they, it's amazing because I mean they, I mean they, they're quite small compared to. I mean they like, like almost like a household dog, the same size. You can't believe how vicious they are when they when they get hold of something. Yeah, I mean, I guess they're kind of like the size of a German Shepherd, but much slimmer. Yeah. It's kind of how I think of it. But I think, yeah, it's really the power in numbers and teamwork makes the dream work. And Tell like, me, do you know when they, um, when typical denning season is for? Around June. Around June. Yeah, and then the puppies will come out normally around September. So if anyone wanted to, to travel to to um Zambezi National or those Zambezi National Park, when would be the best time to see the pups? Um, or when would be the best time to get wild dog sightings? Because when they when they when they're not denning, then they quite they got quite a big range and they're quite unpredictable to see. Yeah, I would say from June until June until beginning of September, because if they're denning, they're in the area. And there's never a guarantee that you'll see the puppies. You have to sort of be there by chance when the puppies go out. But if they are denning, then they will hunt near the den site and always return to the den site. So you have, if you're in the right area, you have a pretty good chance of seeing them during denning season. So it's like from June until end of August, beginning of September. So the other the other place you mentioned was um, Okavango. Um, what what do you like about that? What is what is special about that area for you in terms of photography and what you can see? And... I think it's a similar similar to Lower Zambezi, where it's a very unique landscape, and there's just nowhere else like it. Um, where you have 
you know, where desert hits water and creates this kind of incredibly lush, abundant, diverse environment. And I think almost, you know, everybody becomes a swimmer in the Okavango Delta. I've seen dogs swimming in the Delta. I've seen cats swimming in the Delta. Um, I mean, I know that's something you can see also, wasn't there that very famous cheetahs crossing the Mara River that won the wildlife photographer of the year? Yeah, you know which image I'm talking about? The three cheetahs swimming across the river. There's four of them, even. There's like a there's there like, four. I mean, apparently, like the photographer, I think the pictures only got four of them, but apparently it was a correlation of five males that were. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, they looked. Um, I actually, I actually saw it the other day, and they all looked very, very stressed. And, um, yeah, they did. They, it does look. It looks like high level anxiety for sure. Because yeah, the water I looked think, like um, pretty rapid as well. Yeah, it, it definitely looked like some serious rapids, major current. I think, yeah, I think those are very unusual things to see and you have a very high chance of seeing them in the Delta. And then the landscape is just beautiful. You've got all of the, you know, winding channels and palm trees and animals that are, you know, very uncommon, sort of like a Sitatunga. I've seen two ever in my life of the Sitatunga. It's a very shy aquatic antelope. Um, yeah, in Botswana, I would say similar to Zambia, there's a large expanse of it that's still very, very wild. Yeah. Yeah. So you've worked, um, so obviously the other thing that you do is marketing. So you've worked with a bunch yeah. of lodges, um, different reserves. And um, I like the lodge I obviously know is Anabizi, which I've seen you do, which is beautiful. Um, it's got great social media, great presence. Um, it's very informative. What would you, what do you, what do you, I mean, what can lodges do better? What's, what's in terms of marketing? Because a lot of lodges struggle to market. I mean, how would, what's the best way to market um, a lodge in, in your eyes? Um, I would say number one is, pay content, content creators for your own content and stop using UGC for everything. That would be my number one recommendation because if you don't have quality content and quality images to highlight your camp and your wildlife and who you are, like that's the thing most people have to go on. That's even, you know, that's how agents sell you on their, on their website is with your images. And I think there is a big tendency to not put a lot of value on that or to only put value on sort of the camp photos and the interior photos. And then the wildlife, they're like, oh, well, we have guests with great wildlife photos. So we'll just use those. So I would say that would be my number one is, you know, invest in good quality content. Number two, I would say you don't have to always be selling something like every post you do, every email you do does not have to be selling something per se. I think um, storytelling goes a long way, sort of sharing not only the stories of your, your camp and your brand and your staff, but also of your animals. And, you know, people love to know what's happening. Like the, our three girls, um, so different camps call them different names, but we call them Mai and Lady and Scar. But like people become very invested in their story. They they want to know what's happening. You know, Mai was attacked by a lion. We got hundreds of messages asking if she was okay. And so I don't think every post that you do, whether it's on social media or even a Mailchimp, it's, you don't always need to be selling something. You can also just be sharing information and and telling a story. And then I would also say, you know sharing information that's valuable or things that people want to know. So maybe interesting facts about animals and wildlife that the average person doesn't know. Maybe sharing interesting facts about the country or the park where your camp is, but not not kind of the run of the mill cliche facts, like diving a little bit deeper and looking at how you can sort of inform people and create content that's a bit more interesting and engaging. It makes such a difference. And um, what you mentioned about not just having that user generated content, I mean, because you will get a good picture here and there and a good video, but like mm. what I've noticed with the really successful lodges and Anabezi is one of them, which you do, is there's a brand. Like when you see the videos come up on Anabezi, the, the pictures, they all, it's exactly. the brand. Like you can almost, when you when you see a search, I mean, like I mentioned today, I saw, I saw that, I mean, 
that, that video and I recognize it based on all the leopard stuff that you had told me and, and done. So if you can create a brand, it's like gives your lodge a certain feel about it. So really like, like a special feel and it, like it feels like the rangers or the guides know where the animals are at, at, that they that they're capturing it and i think i think it's really important to have a good brand for your lodge and if you're just re like re relying on other people's photos you're never really gonna have that consistent flow of high quality content no and you're really not in control of your brand when you do that you're not in control of you know does this reflect the does this reflect our brand does this reflect our brand aesthetic our brand values like you are no longer in control of your brand when you rely almost entirely on user generated content because like you said you know you might have something phenomenal from a guest that you can share but with the amount of content you should be sharing on a regular basis that it's never enough you yeah. know there's never enough ugc to be posting like five or six days a week and have it be quality That's, that just doesn't happen so when you at um when you how long will you spend at, at camp um how long will you typically spend there usually like seven seven to ten days about uh every five weeks or so sometimes okay. every month sometimes every five weeks sort of depends on how busy we are and uh, because I occupy a vehicle by myself. <laughs> so, yeah. It depends on how busy camp is and also how busy I am. So I do freelance outside of Lower Zambezi. But definitely, I think this year I spent like a total of seven weeks at camp when you put them all together. And will you be going out by it? Do you go out in your own vehicle or do you have a guide with you or how, do, how does it work? Yeah, so I usually have one of our guides with me because it's very difficult to drive and shoot at the same time. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, I'm not a qualified Zambian guide. I'm just a photographer. So I think as a member of staff, I'm allowed to like drive a utility vehicle technically, but I am definitely not supposed to be out there in a game viewer driving myself out in the park. That's yeah, no. It is nice, and especially if you've got a guide that's that's there the whole time, he understands animal behavior and exactly. I mean, even if just someone's just helping you find the animals and track the animals, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, we work together a lot. Like I have, there's one of um one of our junior guides who drives me the most, and so we're very used to working together. And he knows how I like to position the vehicle, and you know, sort of what I'm looking for. He knows what areas I like to go to, but usually like we'll get in the vehicle and sort of establish what the target is for the day based on what I know I need, maybe what we saw yesterday, maybe like what we heard was happening somewhere else. You know, sometimes I'll be like, let's go look for light in the forest over here, or let's go see what's happening over here, or let's go look for the dogs, or let's go look for, you know, this leopard or but we'll kind of establish a plan together. And then, you know, some days it's water content. So we'll take a boat, go look for elephants crossing, that kind of thing. It makes such a difference if you've got a good guide with you. I mean, I've been on safari and some guides like I must say that the good lodges generally the guides sort of understand photography. But if a guide understands photography and light, because I mean the thing about wildlife photography is you got to get a bit of lucky, but you also need to be in the right place at the right time and understand. Animal. Yeah. And you have to have a lot of patience. Huge amount of patience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've waited. I'm trying to think what's the most I've ever waited. I think the most I ever waited was nine hours for a cheetah kill in Botswana. Nine. Um, yeah. Nine hours. So, I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> how did, how did, <laughs> Did that even start i mean did i mean did you did, were you expecting it to make the kill from the beginning or did you just like stay on it and just sort of gave you a little bit more a little bit more and then eventually i'm like well it started with you know we were following a cheetah mom and her five cubs yeah. and you know we stayed with them for a while and then she made sort of one hunting attempt that wasn't successful then we could tell she was going to try and hunt again but then her cubs kind of gave her up before she could even make a dash for it they were they were very naughty. And then, um, yeah, the guy that I was with uh, has been in the area a very long time and he knew that individual quite well. And he was like, she's gonna make a kill 
in the afternoon and I think we should wait. And I was like, let's wait. How hard is it to, I mean, I, I mean, I've never even got a cheetah running personally. So how hard, how hard was it? I mean, did you actually capture anything or I mean, like how hard is I it? I did. Yeah, I did. So I got footage of two, two different cheetah kills. The first one, um, we were quite far away and we didn't, you don't want to disturb them. Like, yeah. so you, you kind of stay quite far away. So you can see her running and making the kill, but it's not super, super sharp or super crisp. And then also, you know, cheetahs hunt in the middle of the day, which for photographers is the most horrible light possible. Uh, the second one ended up hunting much closer to my vehicle, like we were parked and that was where she happened to go. Um, and I got very good footage of that, but then she ended up taking down the Impala behind a termite mound. So like, you don't see the end. She goes right behind a termite mound and you don't actually see her take it down, which is kind of a bummer, but. You know, it is what it is. It happens. Sure, I'm still, I'm still trying to get. Uh, I'd love to see a cheetah kill. That must be incredible to watch. I mean, that speed. They're just such graceful animals when they run. Yeah, they're gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous cat. Their so, eyes are gigantic. I know they're so beautiful, and just their tail, and just, I'm, just when they're in full stride and like their feet on touching mm. it, really, really beautiful. Yeah. Never tough though. I think they probably got it the toughest of all the cats. Yeah, they do. I mean, they're, they're fighting against a lot. You know, they have low, low genetic diversity. They've got, they're kind of the smallest of the cats, like they're thinnest and smallest. I mean, unless you count like an African wild cat, but like the larger cats, um, their habitat loss, you know, and there was that, yeah, there was a very large disease outbreak of a long, long time ago. I want to say like, over 200 years ago but i could be completely wrong so do not quote me on that um and they that's part of the reason why cheetahs have such low genetic diversity so they they have a very high cub mortality rate rachel so anyone that wanted to go on safari i mean where would you where would you recommend someone to go and why um well my first question would be is there a specific animal you're very attached to seeing and I would choose based on that, if you know. If you absolutely want to see a giraffe, don't go to Lower Zambezi or Monopoles because there are no giraffes. If you absolutely want to see wild dogs, I don't recommend going to Kenya. Uh, if you absolutely want to see cheetahs, I would say go to Tanzania or Botswana. So I think that if you want to see rhinos, go to South Africa. So I think, yeah, first question is like, is there a specific species you're very attached to seeing and like you you'll feel like you didn't really go on safari if you don't see that species that's usually the first question i ask people i think that's the best way to choose a location because i mean they all have something and most locations have something amazing to offer um i would say aim more for national parks than private reserves for yeah. like a truly truly wild experience have you ever been to south africa yeah yeah have yeah, you, yeah. Have you done sabi sands a long time ago a very long time ago yeah it's, maybe it's, over over 10 years ago i think yeah it's amazing i mean i'm sure you follow a lot of the the lodges there like mala mala and londalozi and all that yeah like an yeah incredible like big five, density of big five population. But I think we're competing with them very well on leopard sightings in Lower Zam. I think so, I mean, none of them have a yeah. fair, I mean, like, like genuine, like genuinely, like it's when I'm looking, because I, I spend a lot of time looking at obviously content. It's always like, you guys always got beautiful leopard stuff. And mm. um, and then yeah, Mala Mala and um, Linda Lozi always, they've also, they've, they've obviously invested quite a lot in content. I mean, I think yeah. most guides and rangers are quite good photographers now. Yeah, both of them, you can tell that they put thought and thought and time and effort into their content and it pays off. Yeah. Have you yeah. done any YouTube yet? No, <laughs> I can barely handle managing just my <laughs> own, my own Instagram channel is a struggle. You'll notice like I'll post a bunch of stuff and then I'll stop posting for like a month and then I'll kind of come back and, you know, cause I, spend a huge amount of my time on client work so i i really struggle with my own with my own brand 
Yeah, I know, but um, yeah, you create beautiful content and like you literally one of my favorite wildlife photographers and content oh, creators. Oh, thank you. That's so nice. Yeah, we had you on our list of the best um photographers and um yeah, oh, what? Yeah, didn't you see I'll send it to you. yeah, you're on our list. No. Oh yes. gosh. Yeah. I'm very flattered. Thank you. That's so kind. So, yeah, so um where can where can people find you? Um what's your Instagram handle? Do you have anything um else? Yeah, my Instagram handle is my name. It's at Rachel Rabibo. Uh, my website, I'm actually in the middle of redoing my website right now. My website's rachelrabibo.com. And yeah, definitely you can see my content on the Anabezi Instagram. And I think that's that's about it. I mean, there's other safari camps where you can see my my content usually i'll post some stuff and tag them if you go through my feed you can see some of the other camps that i shoot for what other camps do you shoot for just out of interest uh, i shoot a lot for amalinda safari collection and wangi they're yeah. very very fun yeah they're yeah. a fun group um and then i was doing some i was doing some work for a marketing agency and they sent me to like a, a group of i think four or five lodges in botswana but yeah, I try to tag everybody when I'm allowed to. Okay. Okay. We'll definitely take a look out and we'll link all your stuff in the, in the caption or the bio. And, um, thank you. Yeah, it was lovely chatting to you and, uh, thanks for all the insights and, um, yeah, looking forward to seeing all the stuff. When are you, you on it's off season. Oh, maybe just discuss when does, when is, um, when is season four Zam for, um, for Zambia or Zambia? Uh, for Anabezi, we open before everyone else. So it's Easter. We open Easter, and I believe that's March 31st this year. Okay. So season season will really kick in April, okay, which amazing. is a lovely time to come. The weather is beautiful. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can get down there. I'd love to come check it out. I mean, it looks yeah, like it's, a, it's a gorgeous time to come. The weather is beautiful. Everything is very green. You know, it's not – my favorite, of course, is October. It's – hot as hell super dusty like you know a lot of people can't stand it they they find it way too hot but it's the sightings are just next level you know and you've got all of that like drama of dusty skies and everything is everything is high tension you know everyone's fighting for resources <laughs> because the rainy season hasn't come yet so it's pretty much yeah dry. it's it's like peak dry season i refer to it as kind of like mma for wildlife like it's like everyone is you know everyone is like fighting for their lives at that point but that's when i've had my most 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 spectacular sightings have almost almost always been october except for the leopard family that was june okay so that's that's a good thing to know yeah thank you so much for thank you so much for coming on and was lovely chatting to you and um yeah looking forward to seeing more of your content and hopefully meet up with you soon Thank you for having me. Yeah, definitely let me know when you're coming to Zambia. For sure. Have a lovely day. Bye. You too. Bye.